what's really good what's happening what's crackling high five low five spud 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 what's going on it's the excellent english show episode number 119 with me your host agostino welcome back welcome in yeah what's going on man what are you doing how's it going 119 fast approaching one what um fast approaching 120s right in that, that that kind of zone where we're kind of creeping up against the 120s but we're not there just yet right we're on the 119 that's where we are the 119 zone and we're slowly approaching the 120s i cannot wait and then after that the next milestone is going to be the 150 and after that going to be out of the 200s imagine that out of the 200s the funny thing is i will i've been doing this for what four years right i i did i uploaded my first podcast four years ago but Obviously, um, as most people, um, as we most, as, um, wow, my words cannot get them out of my mouth. Fucking hell. But I guess as most of us can attest to, procrastination can be a hell of a drug, right? So um, even though I've, I've done these, um, I've been uploading podcasts for four years, I wasn't um, as consistent as I've been this year, right? This year has probably been the most consistent I've ever been in terms of uploading podcasts, probably even the, this, um, the last six months have been insane. I've been doing at least a minimum of one a week, if not two, and these the past couple of weeks have done three. So that's fucking amazing. So clap, clap to me. <laughs> amazing. But um, imagine where I would have been if I would have done um, four years just solid podcasting, right? Really solid, like really going for it every single, every single week. Would have been insane. I would have been into that high, 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 high digits. But you know, say la vie, it is what it is, you gotta do what you gotta do, but one of the things I've learned from doing this, or one of the things I've actually, a correlation I've kind of um, linked to, um, I've kind of made since I've been listening to this great book um, by uh, Walter Isaacson on Leonardo da Vinci, I re- recommend you check it out, um, it's a bit of a, it's a bit dense, it's a bit thick, it's a bit long, but if you if you uh, if you grab it on an audio book, you can grab it from Audible. You can visit my link below to get a f- uh, thirty day free trial and uh, what you call it um, and one free book credit. But if you listen to via audio books, are probably a little bit more easier to listen to. But what I've gleaned from listening to War Isaacson's take on um, Leonardo da Vinci's life, and if you if you if you're thinking, oh, where's War? Where, where have I heard that War Isaacson name from? That's the same dude that wrote the book about Steve Jobs, the autobiography about Steve Jobs that kind of, just before he died, the the only official autobiography. Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs uh, reached out to Walter Isaacson because I think um, Walter Isaacson wrote a book about a couple former United States presidents, which uh, Steve Jobs liked. So he kind of, when, he, when Steve Jobs was in... Um, was in remission from his cancer diagnosis. He contacted um, Walter Isaacson and said, "Hey, I want you to do my official autobiography and really kind of laid bare his all his kind of you know ailments and the things that he done wrong in his career. And if anything, that w- that book by Walter Isaacson was the, uh, was one of the main things that kind of led to people changing the company cultures. You know, CEO company culture because before that, you know, you heard legends of of Steve Jobs um, having a what's that thing called um." He had a reality distortion field, right? Where he'd tell engineers in Apple that they had to create a certain type of screen or they had to get the phone down to a certain thickness and they had to do it in two weeks, right? He didn't he didn't care if it was possible or not possible. He drove his teams to like near on death, right? In order to kind of bring out the best possible products. And obviously because startup culture or small business culture in general is a super copycat culture, right? Um, you can you could probably have a line, I'd imagine if you had a high street full of chicken shops, right? And one chicken shop in the middle was doing really well. The chicken shops on either side will start copying whatever that chicken shop was doing. So if it was discounts for students, if it was putting posters um, on the windows, if it was having a sign outside the shop, if it was having a bench where people can sit down, um, there's a lot of copycat culture when it comes to small businesses and even more so when it comes to startups. So when whenever when it, when people are hearing about Steve Jobs' managerial leadership style, a lot of start a lot of CEOs or a lot of kind of wannabe Steve Jobs guys were kind of doing that kind of fake autistic, uh, a little bit socially awkward, um, gruff, really blunt kind of um, way of managing in order to kind of drive their team to bring the best products out. But of course, as most people don't don't kind of um most people are not very self-aware so they weren't very you know they weren't aware that they were not steve jobs right they were never going to be steve jobs and their company wasn't apple so they couldn't get away with treating their cuts their, their employees like shit because they'll just leave and then you're and if you've got good employees who are doing good great work and they feel like they're not being um respected or taken care of it's going to go somewhere else and your business is going to fail 
So um, Steve Jobs re- reached out to him and Walter Isaacson wrote like an amazing book on Steve Jobs. Very balanced. It kind of it shone the light on the stuff that Steve Jobs done well and stuff that he done wrong. And the same can be said for Leonardo da Vinci book, which kind of you know pieces together loads of pieces of Leonardo da Vinci's life. But one thing that I gleaned from it, thinking about the four years I've been podcasting, is that Leonardo da Vinci was incredibly curious, just a very curious individual. I think Walter Isaacson in a few interviews I've seen of him online when he's been talking about the book, he's mentioned that's the one thing you should really take away from the autobiography of Leonardo da Vinci is that you should always remain curious in life. You should always have an interest in things that other people find find mundane, right? Um, for instance, for me, I like to observe. Um, I like to observe uh, fathers and sons specifically, but you, sometimes you can you can get it with mothers and daughters. But usually, fathers and sons walking down the street because if you notice, sometimes for the most part, and especially if the kid is like looks like they're under ten, they usually um, start adapt start taking on a lot of the father's mannerisms even if it's something that's not um and a lot of it i'm, I'm and a lot of it i'm trying to figure out if it's based on dna if it's a genealogy thing or if it's something you just take on through absorption so for instance if if, if a dad's got a certain stride way uh, the way the way that he walks or his gait or the way he swings his arms you'll definitely see the kid doing the same thing nowadays it's quite hard because a lot of their fathers and sons when they're walking down the street the kids got a little scooter they're not really walking but sometimes if you see a two if you see a father and son walking down the street or if you see or, or just what looks like an, an older like um fatherly figure like whether it's an uncle or whatever it may be especially someone that the kid looks up to you'll definitely see a lot of copying a kind of mirroring of what people do in that regard so i like seeing that um, and a, a bunch of other things, but the podcasting was one of the things that was I was curious about. I started listening to podcasts maybe a, maybe a few maybe more than four years ago, probably about ten years ago. I started listening to a few podcasts when they were on Apple for the first time, um, and I just liked the really relaxed nature of it because I, I was a real big fan of talk radio sort of stuff because I used to listen to a lot of talk sport back in the day, but they've gone a bit too they got a bit too clickbaity. It's a little bit too shouty shouty, and, and when I Talk sport and a lot of those sports radio shows um, were a lot like wrestling to me. When I found out that they had um, that they had um, um, that they paid people to call in and have really really ridiculous views on things, like imagine if uh, if a team won uh, by a decisive goal and they were clearly the best team, someone would be paid to call up and say no, they weren't the best team, they got lucky. So then. If I support that team that won, I then call up like, oh my God, I can't believe you said that. And I thought it was all real. I didn't know. Like, again, in my naivety, right? So when I found out that was fake, I kind of turned off of it. But I loved a lot of the talk radio sort of stuff, the kind of, you know, the hour-long calling shows where the um, the host would kind of ramble on about various subjects, similar in the way that I do now. But with podcasting, there was a lot more freedom to it, right? You could swear, you could talk about really taboo subjects, stuff that, and you wouldn't have the annoying 15-minute ad breaks in between, because I do always turn down the radio after that, right? Um, which is weird, right? You can, you can turn, you can add, you can install ad block on Google Chrome to stop ads going on videos. Um, you can effectively skip adverts on YouTube, or you can turn down the volume, or you can kind of flip the phone over if you don't have the thing on, or you can buy uh, at YouTube Premium, right? But on radio, then you can't be forced to listen to an advert. If you're smart enough, you just turn down the volume, right? And then you come back after 15 minutes. Like, that's what you do, right? And they have no way of... I'm surprised they don't... Um, but maybe, again, it's, it's that whole, like, privacy thing. They can't really enforce their way in. But I'm surprised they haven't figured out a way of ensuring that the sound is up some way so you can hear the volume. Because on every other advert, they make... In, in, any other kind of pop-up ad, they, they engineer in a way where, like, you have to watch it. But it must be the most ineffective way of uh, marketing an item, right? But I guess especially if you're... I don't know, like... When's the last time you've ever clicked on one of those adverts, those kind of like ad rolls before a YouTube video? It never works, right? Especially they're not targeted and not anything in within the interest group of the thing you're watching. Just some random thing. Like it just, you'd never, I've never think, oh yeah, I actually need, I need to check out that lotion or that fucking holiday or what you call it or um, travel agent or whatever it may be. It doesn't really work that way, does it? But I don't know. So yeah, this podcast is brought, is brought to you by Curiosity. Curiosity in listening to other people talk, which means I was like, you know what? I can do that. I can talk as well on a microphone. So I did it. Maybe not as good as other people. Maybe not as funny. Maybe not as interesting. Uh, maybe not as um, illuminating. But I'm doing the same thing. So fuck it. Anyway, yeah. Apart from that, everything's going well. Apart from the working out, man. It's been fucking hard this like sober October to work out. It's got to be honest. I find it really, really difficult to find the motivation to do it. Um, I think because I don't have a race. Races really help me. 
Um, I do it anyway, right? I go and work out anyway. I slog through it, but I'm finding it hard to kind of just get up and be pumped for it. But again, I think it's a lack, lack of races. I feel like I need to go back to start um, scheduling my little 5Ks and 10Ks because those were great because they kept you, they kept me training and they also kept me honest. So I didn't really cheat. Like the other day I had a sandwich late at night. Do you know what I mean? It's like I never do that sort of thing. I'm usually fasting um, for 16 hours a day, um, but I didn't do that at that time. So it's like, you know, it can, it can kind of, you know, throw you off, of course, but I'm back on the wagon now. I had a nice healthy breakfast this morning. Uh, a couple of fried eggs with some spinach and spring onions and a couple of saveloys I had in the leftover in the fridge. And now I've got a salad and some tuna left for lunch and I'm going to be back on it, ready to go. But yeah, um, you know what? Because it's 119 and, and we we're short on time. Because it's 119 and we're short on time, let's get back into it. Loads of things to talk about, loads of topics to go through. Let's dive on deep. Number one, um, why does everyone hate Brendan Shorb? So, um, this is a weird topic because I'm sure a lot of you guys don't know what I'm talking about or have no interest in this, but I think there's a lot of lessons to be gleaned from this overall, as always, right? Um, I'm not really a fan of talk, talking um, chatty patty-ish about celebrities or getting involved in people's businesses, but I think sometimes, as always, celebrities are a good mirror for our societal problems or issues, right? They hold up a mirror and show us the things that we should be avoiding or the things that we should be trying to do more of, right? Sometimes I think, like, especially with people in the limelight, I think you should do more of what they do and less of what they say they're doing, right? You should look at that kind of thing, like, look at the frequency they're uploading, look at what they are uploading, look at the projects they're doing, look at the projects they're not doing, look at the events they're attending and not attending. I think that's more... Um, um, beneficial than listening to you know them talk because I I listened to uh, the Martinez brothers do an interview the other day the two um, very well known DJs in the underground electronic scene and they gave away this like throwaway advice like oh man you just got to follow your heart you got to do what's true to you you know that doesn't really mean anything it's pleasant it's pleasant don't get me wrong um, it's not really helpful though but if you watch if you go on YouTube um, and you search Martinez brothers and you do uh, reverse search you do like upload date you'll see loads of videos of them DJing all across. Um, the festival season all across Ibiza um, you'll see them playing loads of different types of sets and then what you'll do then you go on their social you track the things that they're doing you think ah okay this is what they're doing in order to become successful this is the things that they're jumping on this is the labels that they're signed to and then you'll try and kind of follow suit but if you listen to the hey man just follow your heart you know go with the flow um, be true to you it's like what anyway so Lesson gleaned from the whole Brendan Shaw thing. So Brendan Shaw is uh, one of the co-hosts for The Fire and the Kid, which is a really popular podcast. Something A podcast I've been listening to from the very beginning. I love The Fire and the Kid. He does it alongside Brian Kellen. They have like, it's basically called The Fire and the Kid. And the whole dynamic behind it is that Brendan Shaw is a former fighter. And um, Brian Kellen isn't a kid, but that's a whole comedic angle of it because he's a 50-year-old man, um, 50-year-old gay man. But he does, a, but he's very funny, right? And they kind of have this kind of dynamic where they kind of riff off, riff off, riff off each other. It's gone, it's, you know, it's blown up immensely over the last few years. Brian Callen's kind of used it to segue him and get him. He's got his own, he's went into the Goldbergs. Now he's got his own spinoff as one of the, because uh, he plays a coach in the Goldbergs. Brendan Schaub has got a Showtime special that he's got coming up, which is the point of condition here. He's got his um his own show on Showtime 2 called Below the Belt. That's um, mixed martial arts and all, you know, forms of fighting specific he's got another show that he does that's based on celebrity uh reality tv shows and trash tv shows on bravo i forgot the name of it he does a kind of panel show with dudes that like to watch kind of that kind of stuff which is a really good uh premise i like the angle of it so uh, they, they're you know they're fairly popular in what they do but the whole brendan shaw thing if you want to see is like um he's a former ufc fighter who's now uh a stand-up comic right and uh, he's friends with Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan always says whenever they're having interviews with him that he's got an insane work ethic, that he's just, you know, he works harder than any other comic he knows. And because, you know, we're in a new era now where uh, podcasting for some celebrities or some people, especially if you've seen um, what Will Smith is doing, Will Smith is like going full tilt with the whole YouTube thing, right? And most of it has to do with the fact that I think the film before last that he did didn't really get that much box office revenue, right? It wasn't as big as his previous movies has, has been, right? But he's also one of the most unique celebrities, uh, Hollywood A-list actors out there because he's very, um, uh, his personality lends itself really well to social media, right? He's super funny. Um, he's really talented. Like he, he works on social media really well, more so than any other person, right? I don't think Matt Damon will transfer that word on social media, for instance, right? So... 
Or maybe he wouldn't if he did that sketch stuff. I don't know. But, you know, Will Smith has got that kind of personality where he kind of works on social media really well. So the theory goes that Will Smith is doing this whole social media run so that he can kind of increase his awareness in the hope that when he puts out another movie, if even if it is another Netflix movie, even if it's a blockbuster, um, a cinema movie, he's going to, you know, the the opening weekend is going to be absolutely nuts because everyone knows who Will Smith is through all these little stunts he's doing, through the trips, the vlogging, blah, 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 blah. So in this new era that we're in now, podcasting has kind of um, replaced traditional kind of promo runs and all that sort of malarkey and other ways of you to garner a fan base. Because if you're a comedian, the only way you'd garner a fan base is if you went around touring the country, if you went around recording specials, uploading them, or, or, or having them kind of, you know, broadcast on various um, stations, right? That's how you kind of gained a, a kind of following. Or, and then social media came along and you could post pictures, you could post little clips of yourself, you could post twi- uh, jokes on Twitter, which is a real skill in itself, right? Not everyone can do that. Um, there's loads of things that you could, could have done, but podcasting has really been the thing that's really elevated or really skyrocketed, uh, skyrocketed some comedians, um, you know, success trajectory. A good example would be Fia Vaughn, right? A really funny comic, someone I've been following for a, the longest time anyway, but he's gone, you know, he's gone to heady, heady heights because he does his own podcast now, right? This past weekend, which you can find on all podcasting platforms. Brennan Schaub is the same sort of um, person, but Brennan Schaub is a, a little bit more of a trickier proposition for other comedians to deal with because he's a former UFC fighter. He didn't come through the, he didn't come through the um, open mic uh, kind of route. He didn't bust his ass kind of, I don't know, being a bartender or, you know, doing the door or whatever it may be, the kind of traditional route, right? He kind of came in it being the kind of former UFC fighter, retiring, or UFC fighter, retiring, starting a podcast with a very famous comedian, having that incredible banter and chemistry they have, people realizing, oh, wow, he's really talented and he's good on camera himself, um, Brennan Shaw. And then from that, he kind of segued into stand-up. So he kind of skipped loads of, he's kind of skipped the first, you know, maybe the first five, six years of comedy. Like, if, you've, if you listen to people with this, if you listen to a lot of comedians, they always say it takes 10 years to get good, right? Just to get good, not to get amazed, just 10 years. But in that 10 years, that's where you do the open mics, that's where you do, you know, you perform in the middle of a restaurant. Yeah, you do all those kind of really shitty things. And then after the 10 years is when, you know, you start to kind of finally get some headway, you start to maybe become a regular, you start to get paid to tell jokes and, you know, whatever may happen, happens there. You can maybe quit your full-time job. But Brent Charles missed that kind of first chunk. And a lot of people, I, I always thought it was true, but you didn't really hear a lot of people say it because I'm sure people don't want to be don't want to be classified as a hater but i will i will because i because i because i know how people on the internet are and i know how a lot of comedians are too listen to podcasts and okay they can be a little bit uh snipey and a little bit um ven- not vengeful but they can be a little bit better about things right i knew for sure that brendan Shaw was someone that they didn't like right or they kind of hated his kind of his success but unfortunately you know he's a former ufc he's a former heavyweight um, UFC fighter, there's no way no one's going to inflict any sort of physical harm to him. So the most they can do is probably, you know, the most you can do to a comedian to really hurt them really is not have your respect of your peers, which I'm sure he has maybe in some respects, but there's been a bit of a backlash, been a bit of a beef between Brendan Schaub and another comedian. Uh, or on beef, but like something to learn from. Um, a comedian called uh, Luis J. Gomez, who's got a podcast with a uh, former, former UFC fighter too, called Mike, Michael Bisping. So they kind of were speaking about the whole point, you know, a whole the whole idea that Maybe Brendan Schaub isn't as funny as he should be because he's got a, 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 com- a Showtime special coming up. But again, I thought it was very interesting in terms of lessons learned, in terms of how people should approach um, other people's success. Because I don't really necessarily agree with what Lewis German says in overall. Let me see if I can get the video up and play a little bit of it. Uh, la, 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 la. This the one? One week ago, right? Yeah, let's see if it plays. Got it on here, so you guys hopefully can see this, can hear this, and play this now. Bum, bum, bum. Hopefully it plays now. Come on, play. YouTube is so slow today. What's happening? Oh, they, you was, they were talking about me, and you're like, yeah? Everybody listens to this podcast. If you're a fucking man and you're able, get into to me and I didn't really have too much of an issue with it and you're like no Mike they were taking shots at you as well they said and, 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 and then and then because I'm like they so wife easy to wind around. up I'm like you, you you're fucking well Lewis they did they said they, <laughs> they, 
they were talking about me, and you're like, yeah, yeah, listen. And, and like, I listened, and I'm like, no, they're not. And you're like, yeah, they are. I'm like, you're right, they are. Let's get him. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're like, he's so dumb. They're he's so of, easy it, to come It was really, it wasn't even, it's not even a point. They didn't even talk shit about anybody. They alluded. Don't, Where are they alluding? Yeah, you're, you're right. That's the, Why are you alluding? If, if they said it direct, I'd actually laugh. Who cares? Just, they're right. Yeah, because I don't care. They're kind of right with what they said. Most people don't have chemistry over Skype. Yeah, Ellis Mania is kind of a mockery of the sport. Yeah, yeah. Sure, you're right. These are all correct. Yeah, but don't allude. Don't, but don't allude. allude. Just yeah, say. Yeah, you're right. That's what it is. That's the only thing that I'm offended about. If they just said, oh, yeah, Bisman Lewis, fucking he's trying to be a fighter and this and that. Man, what the hell? What if, if they would have been like, what a fucking asshole. He's trying to fight. Yeah, yeah. I would have laughed like, yeah, you're right. I said, yeah, you said it to my face a hundred times. I would have sent them a text. I would have texted him just job and be like, yeah, man, that, that was funny. I say the same thing to Lewis every week. <laughs> but they allude. And when someone alludes and they don't say what they're trying to say and they're dancing around the subjects and they're trying to be offensive without saying it, just, that gets on my tits. Just say it. That don't gets get on, on my tits. Don't get on his tits. If you ever get on my tits get again. Get off his tits. You get off my tits. Oh, dear. Can all right, all right. Roll tape. Roll some of this. I, and so Josh, I, I, and I Josh hear this. Wolf was on their show, and Josh is a funny comic I know. So um, he asked me this past year. He goes, "You want to come? Do, you want to come fight?" And I was like, "I don't. I don't think so." Would you go fight? No, and I, and I, I fight or I try to. I, yeah. I, I mean, I don't fight, but I'm. In, I practice. And why wouldn't you do it? Because there's no upside to it, and also in those I situations. I find it embarrassing. Yeah. What but, do you mean? But, but, I'd be embarrassed if he did that. Yeah. But so it, right, yeah, there, that that right there is a direct oh, no, shot oh, no. you. Here, here's what There's we see. The manipulation you. of Michael Bisping, okay? Go ahead and manipulate me because no. because you told... No, 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 please, please, you please. Said? Don't hold back. Because you said to me, he's talking about you there. I'm like, That's you. I don't think he is. He said, I would be embarrassed. Meaning that you, if he was, if I was Michael Bisping, I would be embarrassed. Back it up. If my... Back it up, show me again. Wind the monkey. <laughs> do it because there's no upside to it and also in those I situations find it embarrassing. yeah play best play he asked what do you mean? Mean? But i'd be embarrassed he if he, he asked yeah. him, would you do it would you fight at alice mania which is the thing that yeah. i fought at a few months ago which i'm the only comedian to ever fight at alice mania yeah who the fuck else are they talking about yeah we fucking know but Let's hold on real. but hold on hold on just because brendan sharp says i'd be embarrassed I'd be embarrassed so softly and so femininely and with his hands so well manicured and his j hair gel so perfectly done and his kick game of the day on display on his Instagram story and his drip drip going, okay? <laughs> Just because he fucking said that like that, what makes you think that he's talking about me? He's, saying, he's talking about you. He's saying if I was in Michael Bisping's shoes, I'd be embarrassed. I Meaning you should be embarrassed, not only for your podcast partner, but of yourself, for the decisions you make in your life, Michael Bisping. Oh, well. You should be embarrassed for who you are. That's what he just said. Anyway, continue. Okay. Verbatim. But, it, but I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what. I have so much respect for fighting yeah. and for what guys like him have done. That anyway, I'm going to pause it for now because I think there's a little bit too much contrition going on there. It's going on and on and on and on and on. But effectively, the whole premise of the situation is, um, you know, a famous comedians are a little bit protrude, a little bit annoyed that uh, Brendan Schaub is, you know, I can I can sense it from again. I'm not I, I, I'm I'm a fucking nobody from the middle of London or nowhere in London. So I don't know anything. I don't know inside details. But I can sense that some comedians feel a little bit annoyed that Brendan Schaub is getting himself a Showtime special when he's only been, you know, doing comedy or seriously for maybe two years or something. Or wherever it is, right? He's kind of overstepped some people's mark and he's, you know, he's making a, you know, a crazy amounts of cash. He's very, um, he's probably uh, relatively more famous than a lot of them are as well too. So there's a lot of layers there. So I think, again, lessons to be learned from everyone going forward. I don't think there's an issue. I don't think there's a real issue with being annoyed or being frustrated on people's success. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think if it feeds you, if it kind of allows you to be more driven, if it allows you to kind of hustle more, if it allows you to maybe, maybe analyze the things that you're doing that might be wrong, if it allows you maybe even to question what you're doing and maybe think, you know what, am I actually following my dream or am I just trying to be something? That I see everyone else being because it's easy or because it's the thing nearest to me. Whatever it hap whatever happens, I think the actual act of like being envious of somebody isn't bad, I don't think. If it drives you to do something, I don't think it's bad. I think envy in terms of questioning why they're getting it 
why he or she has this or that that's when it kind of is gets a bit wrong for me and it doesn't it's not it doesn't serve any purpose it, it, it only uh, breeds bitterness it only makes you more angry and get more frustrated because it's a really it's a really hard thing to kind of um it's a really hard it's a really hard pill to swallow if you're Luis Jane Gomez right because it might just be a fact that Brendan Shaw is getting all the success and you're not getting it because he's just funnier than you even after two years right Imagine if that was true, objectively. Imagine if objectively, Brendan Schaub is just funnier than you after two years than you have been your whole career. That's a very bitter pill to swallow because what it does is that it puts a mirror directly in your face and it tells you that you're the problem, not the person outside. So that's hard to deal with. I understand. But then you might step back and say, no, I guess you know, you're fucking wrong. I'm more funny than him. All right, cool. No problem. But then if you want to analyze it deep down and anyone in general in life, I think for a lot of people do this, especially people that I know in the scene or people that are my age or a bit younger. You look at people that have been fe featured on like, um, you know, on Hypebeast or who have, you know, uh, adverts or who are on getting paid to be influencers and you can kind of get a bit bitter and they get angry at stuff, right? But sometimes you have to kind of look at it and analyze all the different layers that that kind of you know play into the reason why that person is there and where you are right i've mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that i've been doing this for four years right i've only my first podcast four years it's, it's kind of reached five years uh, this year but i'm only on episode 119 what does that say about my work rate what does that say about my commitment level what does that say about my determination what does that say about me allowing procrastination to take over me or to win it says that it won, right? It says that in the last few years, or in the last year and a half, or in the last 12 months, I've then decided to get serious and upload these more regularly. And look what's happened, right? Little by little, every episode, more downloads, every episode, more plays, whatever, more consistency. I'm finding it a little bit more easy to talk into camera, blah, 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 right? So then if I was to say now that I'm upset or that I'm pissed off that so-and-so is a bit further along than I am, that would be crazy if you looked at then if you looked at the black and white cold hard facts right you haven't been consistent me meaning with doing this one thing right for four years they've been consistent doing this one thing for two years who do you think is going to win right that's just it's just like who do you think is going to be who do you think is going to be more able to uh grab onto success when it passes by them because sometimes success is also luck it's also luck there's a lot of timing involved in it a lot of like things that are outside your control like talent blah 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 but the whole idea behind it is that you know you mix a bit of talent you mix a bit of hard work a bit of determination a bit of commitment and then when luck comes your way when somebody cancels something and they want to call you to cover when um I don't know when somebody happens to land on your page by accident or or somebody overhears somebody speaking about you in public whatever it may be you can be ready to take up the, the chance the opportunity to take it with both hands but again people don't want to do that they don't want to do the hard work of like looking a bit deeper into the issue and kind of figuring out why so and so is happening but then there's another side of the story too which is like it's the internet age, right? We're living in the age where people are becoming uh, micro celebrities in their own little field of, of expertise, right? If you click trainers, there's you have people out there who are going to follow you just for trainers who I won't know about. If you're a fan of country music, there's people that are fans of a country music star who are also celebrities, right? There's 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 like you know I'm sure there's there's a Drake super fan out there who other super fans follow to get the latest Drake news right there's all these little micro micro celebrities that exist all over the the interwebs right who are not necessarily conventionally billboard famous so it could be argued that there's so much abundance out there that it doesn't really matter if Brendan Shaw gets a Showtime special in six weeks or in two years into his stand-up career it doesn't matter because maybe he's occupying a completely different lane than what Luis J. Gomez is. Maybe his audience is completely different. Maybe there's enough community, comedy fans in the world, right, to go around that it doesn't matter if he gets a certain special and you get something that goes on Hulu or you get something that you have to upload on your own website. It doesn't matter because, like, effectively, what they all want to do, like, in various stages of it, because, I've again, having worked a full-time job, I think I have a little bit more of a new, new, not nuance, but I think I have a little bit more, um, I can step away from the situation, right? I'm a bit more detached from it. And I can also appreciate that being somebody that's mildly creative now, the only thing that I would want, right? I would take, like, this is being dead, dead honest. I would take half of my monthly salary from my job if it meant that I'd just be able to upload videos, DJ, write on my blog, take pictures and whatever. Like, if I could just do that as a job, I would take half of my salary at work, half. 
easily and i'll just live you know what i mean frugally i won't go out to eat as much like i as long as i can cover my rent pay my bills pay for my oyster card i'm i'm good that's what i'll do i'll take half of it so imagine when you begin that's all you want you just want to get paid you just want to get paid for telling jokes so if that's the case and you're on the internet you could get paid to get told jokes ad, ad nauseum how many podcasts are Luis J. Gomez has? Luis J. Gomez is part of um, All Gas Di- or Gas Digital. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sure, sorry, the name of it, it escapes me, but he's got, he's, he's part of many podcasts. He does loads of things, right? Um, um, Legion of Skanks is a very, very popular podcast that he hosts. Like, he's very, very um, well known on that kind of com- New York comedy circuit, right? Um, he's integrated himself with the MMA community, his podcast with Michael Bisping. Like, he's got things going for him in his own little lane. Um, it would be very, it, it's quite ridiculous for him to ex- ex- expect to get anything that Brendan Shaw is getting because they're two completely different people. Even just, like, the ribbing that Michael Bisping was giving Brendan Shaw about he's getting his nails manicured and he gels his hair and he wears nice shoes. They're different people. Do you know what I mean? Like, they appreciate different things and they come from different points of view. If Brendan Schaub is able to get comedy special after two, I don't think it's a bad thing. I just think it means that he's occupying a different space in comedy. And also, it might be that he's also somebody that's breaking new ground because we probably haven't seen this before. We haven't seen somebody that's podcast famous then jump into stand-up and then get to special really quickly. That I, I don't think we've seen it. We've seen some YouTube personalities who have got um, who kind of go and sell out comedy stores or sell out you know big arenas doing their kind of quote unquote brand of comedy, which isn't really that funny, right? Um, that those um, really hot kind of Vine girls that do their kind of weird comedy that isn't really funny. I forgot the name. There's a couple of girls that people roast online who's not funny at all, but kids like uh, there's a there's an audience for it that like that sort of stuff, and they go and watch them do their little sketches, their kind of improv comedy live. But it's fine. There's enough pie to go around with the internet. There's so much abundance. And I think the idea of scarcity is weird because there's a lot. There's kind of these weird little subsections within the same industry. Stand up being one of them, where I think because a lot of it is based on built. A lot of it kind of comes from the old school idea that you know when your when your special gets announced, you get the marquee on the front of the of the comedy store. You get a billboard announcing a special that's on HBO. There's a lot of visibility um, attachment with some comedians, right? Where they feel as if like they're not being seen. That I mean, that means they're not successful. But if you've got a podcast that's you know allow you know has like a thousand plus downloads and you have many sponsors and you run ads on your YouTube videos, you are good, man. Especially and on top of the stuff that you do when you go tour and you uh, are a regular at a store. You're making money. That's amazing. You're making money standing up telling jokes. That should be a, that's a privilege, not like a God-given right. Like, loads of people out there are struggling and not able to, you know, scratch a penny, to, to rub two pennies together. And they're really, really funny. I'm sure of it. There's people that do exist out there who are, you know, micro celebrities in their own little community, but still work a full-time job, but, you know, haven't necessarily got to the big time. And you have. It's like, it's a very weird, weird, weird situation to be in. I think if you're a Brendan Schaub, it's probably a little bit... It can be maybe a bit disheartening because you might think some of the more respected comedians in your so in your so group of, of friends might think the same thing. It might be the it might not be the most um, advantageous thing for him to do right now in his career. Right again, I don't know anything. I'm, I've not done stand up in my life. I, no, no one fucking listens to me. I'm an I'm, I'm an ant compared to him. Um, but it might not be the best thing, you know, to kind of get that success this earlier on in your kind of journey. It seems like if you listen to a lot of people. What comedians, what they say when they say like, oh, they were, they got, um, I think Brett Kaisha mentioned it a couple of times that, you know, you get lucky, um, you do a reading and people think you're really funny and then you get given a show, but then the show gets cancelled and then like five years or 10 years later, you're, you're thankful you never did that show because you were definitely not ready, right? You might have been funny, but you weren't ready for the entertainment industry. And I think maybe Brendan Shaw, maybe after two years, he might not, again, I haven't seen his stand up, so he might just be more talented than certain people, but maybe he's just not that funny yet in that respect to kind of command a showtime special but because he's got so much eyes on him again it's an attention economy right um gary v talks about it a lot like social media is an attention economy if you have eyes on you if you have a following brands want that following they want to pay you for that following which is why people pay for fake followers right if you have a following people like you they will pay for it standard no one gives a shit they don't care if you're funny, not funny. If you have a following, they'll get paid for it. So, um, Brendan Sean being as big as he is, like, come on, man. Like, he's one. Of, I mean, he probably has one of the best social media presence out there for most comedians. Like, most comedians aren't that good on social media. They don't update their dates. They're not tweeting regularly. It's just a st- weird world for some of it. Some of them are like, there's 
that some of them are like really into social media. Some of them are in the middle and just doing it because they have to do it. And some of them don't have anything. It's a very strange industry, I think, overall. It kind of mirrors a lot of DJ culture too, where some of the biggest acts, where some of the biggest touring DJs have no social media presence at all, right? They're able to kind of just tour circuits around around locally or within their region. And some people are, you know, some of the younger kids who are coming through, especially the EDM dudes, are like all about the social media. So very, very weird world. Again, I just think overall for lessons learned, um, don't compare your success to others. Don't compare your journey to others. Um, there's abundance going around. There's so much stuff out there for all of us to eat and enjoy of. We don't need to be sniping at each other in order to kind of gain a foothold in the industry. Enough fans for all of us to go around. And someone's success isn't an indication that you're not successful either. Relax. Take it easy, man. It's all going to be okay. Um, what's next on the docket here? Oh, Dixon interview. Yeah, this really good interview with Dixon. Like, I don't think, I'm not sure if it's new. It's, it, it, I saw it on Sense. I'm pretty sure it's not new. Um, um, Essence or Essence is really popular. Oh, what's happened here? Why is that link not working? Oh, that's why. So, um, uh, Sense is a really popular um, Montreal, I think, no, Canadian based online men's retail. I think it's Montreal. I'm not too sure. I'm not going to be, I'm going to be honest. But they do really good editorials, like, for an online store. Like, they've smashed it. Like, they really do really, really good editorials. Really good shoots and editorials. Um, and they did one um, with Dixon that I highly recommend you check out. It's really, really amazing. Really illuminating um, expose on him. He talks about his love of fashion, his approach to DJing. I've got it up here on the screen for some of you guys to see. And, yeah, Dixon's just one of my favorite DJs co coming up overall. Um his aesthetic overall is very interesting the way they do parties his limited releases he's kind of like anti-celebrity anti-spreading himself to thin ethos um you know like and i just loved um the whole you know that whole era where he was kind of where he i think he run ra dg of the year three times back to back right and i just loved hearing him talk about that whole turmoil he was going through about you know having to deal with the fact that he had to kind of live up to the reputation of being you no. Know, known as one of the best DJs in the world and kind of fighting against it and it was a very interesting time to kind of because that was also during a time when EDM DJs you know like um what's his name uh people or well, the guy that throws a uh, cake in people's faces and shit there was a lot of like celebrity culture attached with DJing and he was really kind of he was really, he was really at odds with it right because there's so much opportunity there right for him to kind of set his family up for life in, in general right by going on tour and making money on the road but then there's also kind of that idea that your that your artistry or your work is kind of suffering because you're spreading yourself too thin and I love kind of hearing him speak really candidly about how he kind of approached it and there's loads of really interesting um uh tidbits on here that i really recommend you check out these hair and preston jeans are quite nice aren't they I, again they're not for me i probably not something i would wear but seeing how seeing dixon wearing them in, in irl like the hair and preston jeans are like you know the, the denims with the kind of um the orange sort of like a uh, sticker tape sort of like motif on the low on the lower half of the leg and the top half of the leg they're quite they're not not too bad um yeah but i recommend you check it out it's a really really interesting interview i'm going to click i'm going to attach the link on there in the show notes so you can basically check it out um but yeah overall i think it's cool and there's a real what's a what's a real bit here uh, i liked as well yeah here's a bit i liked as well uh, so he says here um so the question the interview asked him so you see yourself as and this interview too is really cool he did really good questions um he really pro prong uh, probed uh dixon and got some really good answers out of him so it says here, um, so you see yourself as a DJ, not as a musician. Um, and Dixon answers, I put out a lot of music, but I do not see myself as a gifted musician. I'm a very good DJ, period. Is DJ a service provider? People go to club because they want to have fun. Music is only part of the experience. It has to be, it has to do with the special situation. The other people. I didn't stumble into clubs in the early 90s because I was fascinated with techno. I was fascinated with other people, which is something that I've kind of always spoken, I've always kind of thought about my kind of infatuation with nightlife culture. A lot of it has to do with the music. A lot of it has to do with the cities that the clubs are, are situated. A lot of it has to do with the clubs itself. A lot of it has to do with the kind of the business side of the nighttime industry, which I'm really interested in, which is, you know might be a good website, you know, the business of clubbing or something along those kind of lines, right? But what I really like about nightlife culture is the people, right? Is the idea that different parties you go to, you see such a wide swath of the population all kind of, you know, dancing and celebrating under these dimly lit lights, right? Um, 
you don't know anyone's socioeconomic position, you don't know anyone's race, race, color, you don't know anyone's kind of sexual orientation or whatever it may be, right? You're all kind of in this weird, dark, enclosed space and you're kind of sharing this kind of shared moment, this sort of like shared ecstasy amongst each other. That's something that's really captivated me a lot and I'm glad he kind of spoke on it. The interview continues and says, uh, the people, the excess, the going out as um, aspect, the colors, the clothes. I saw that, I can, I, I can even hear Dixon saying in his accent, his German accent. Um, I saw that it was another world and I wanted to be part of it. And at some point, the music came too. People want sex. It's part of the whole system. It's a mistake to think one person dominates everything with the music. What constitutes a perfect party to you? To get lost in the moment, of course, in a vision. Um, that is why we created Lost in the Moment Party. A series over the past few years, organizing parties in castles, in museums or on an island outside of London. What we're doing is independent of location. We can do it in the most adverse circumstances. On an Osea island outside of London, people had to bust. Um, people had been bust in the morning, but then a flood came, so there was no going back. You have to play in a context that are good for you. The smaller the crowd, the riskier you can be. When I play at a festival and make some crazy statement, people look at the clock and say, you know what, blah, blah, blah is playing over there. Let's check it out. If I'm playing on an island, they can't get off of it. So artistic freedom is given. That's amazing, right? <laughs> Oh, 25 years um, club and culture experience all over the world behind you. Does this place, does this space still work for you? Is it not thoroughly commercialized? I think the last five years have been shown some interesting signs of life. In our field, electronic dance music. Berlin has always been the bellwether for what um, will be happening everywhere later on. Uh, we, what we're experience, what we've experienced here in recent years with the Easy Jet set, with the Easy Jet set is a widespread phenomenon now. It, is, it isn't New York as I see when I go to New York, but people from Chicago, Montreal, Stockholm. Music is part of this idea of experiencing two days of somewhere else on a relatively small budget. Actually, I just thought of something. What's that? You asked me um, at the beginning how it ca all came about with the DJ career. I've always moved between stores, so to speak. I was on the Sonar Collective label, but I wasn't with the key players. Before that, I was regularly playing at parties that were thrown by Alex M. Alex Empire from Atari Teenage Riot. I played a house set. Imagine him raw, man. Imagine him playing alongside the Atari Teenage Riot. That would sound so weird, isn't it? Um, I played a house set during those the, one of those brutal industrial evenings, and it was clear I was doing it for the last time in that particular context. I didn't really fit in um, when I started playing in the legendary Berlin club, w, WMF, either. Um, it's absolutely amazing to play at Panorama Bar slash Bergheim nowadays, but now nobody would say that I'm really part of it. I have felt like a misfit for a very long time in a negative sense, but at a certain point, I realized that it just means I have to do my own thing, and that is probably a strength. Since then, we've tried to apply this, um, everything we do at Innovision, starting our own label, our own record store, our own booking agency. I wanted to do it like Dries Van Noten. He was a role model for it. I love the idea, right? The idea that he was always a misfit. And through being a misfit, that's why he created his own opportunity in order to kind of succeed. Again, it's an amazing um, expose, amazing interview. I'm pretty sure it's uh, quite old, but I don't care. And I also like the fact that some of these um, websites, especially um, um, uh, this online retailer sense, they do this thing where they don't publish the date of the article. I think that's super important. I know... Um, Sometimes on my blog, I kind of try and publish dates or have an archive there so I can feel like I'm not doing anything because I want to blog every day, but I don't. If you look at the dates, you can see some of the numbers aren't illuminated blue. But sometimes people don't read stuff because it, it, it's ah, it's, it was he, re he read it, he read this last year. What does it matter? I think I remember Tim Ferriss doing the same thing in his blog. Um, there's no dates on their blog entries, just the entries themselves. So people just have to look at them and kind of search them themselves. So that's a really good idea. The kind of fact that it's just it's just content. It doesn't matter. It's just writing. I mean, it doesn't matter when I when I read this. It's still true to this day. It's like when you listen to um or when you read quotes from James Baldwin, right? The the well known intellectual public intellectual. Um, some of the stuff that he talks about in terms of race relations in the U.S. There are things that still apply nowadays, right? It doesn't necessarily mean you know you have to kind of throw in a bin because it, you know churchill said it back then so yeah i love i love it i recommend you check it out um interview with dixon the world famous dj on scent right now next on the docket list let's have a look here um virgil pop-up shop in london oh yeah so this is meant to be happy oh, i was meant to go, actually go today but I, of course i'm here um i booked a slot to go visit the the louis vuitton um and virgil Abloh pop-up shop in mayfair it's a little slot you have to pick in, but it's a, just a cube. I'm not really, I'm not, but I'm probably bothered, not bothered. That I went, but it's nice to kind of see things, right? I'm always a big proponent of actually going to see things for yourself, 
go and touch and look at the things yourself. So, um, as most of you are aware, Virgil Abloh is a menswear director of Louis Vuitton. He debuted his first collection of Spring Summer 19 last, uh, well, a few months back, and it was, you know, received really well considering that he kind of gets a bit of a unfair rap or an unfair bit of criticism from some of the fresh fashion um um, conglomerates or fashion press you know they've got their own agendas but he doesn't tend to get favorable reviews but um this collaboration this uh debut collection he did with louis vuitton got some really really good feedback and i wasn't surprised if you've seen anything I've, if you heard anything i've spoken about when it comes to virgil i was always under the premise i've always said that he's although he might not be as talented a designer as some other people out there and i'm sure he'd be the first to admit that i think the uh, the way he puts ideas together and how he connects dots he's a real kind of savant of his time right he's a real kind of you know he's He's got his finger on the pulse in the same way that a Demna has, right? They just understand what's kind of going on in the cultural zeitgeist and able to kind of pluck it out and apply and kind of apply it to whatever label that they're doing at that, in that present moment. That's something that is without a doubt. And given the resources and the quote unquote atelier and uh, talent that Louis Vuitton will have access to, I was in no, I had no shadow of a doubt that the stuff Louis, that stuff Virgil would put out at Louis Vuitton would far exceed anything he did that did at Off White. Off-white kind of feels a bit DIY. It kind of feels a little bit rough around the edges. Some of the stuff that goes goes down the runway doesn't look like it fits well. Like there's a bit of roughness to do uh, um, around Off-white. Um, you know the idea that he kind of does what he's designed through WhatsApp group message and he utilizes his phone and he's all around the world. There's an idea that he kind of like is using Off-white as a sort of like um, a case study of how to run a modern day fashion label, right? Um, it's done in a, kind of, in, a, in a new, fresh way. So maybe the the actual garments themselves are isn't the the most important thing to see in Virgil's point of view. I don't know. Maybe it might be true. Maybe it might not be. But the idea that he's putting the process out there, he's kind of pulling back the curtain of fashion, showing you know this is the dirty secret. Here's how it kind of. Here's how the. Here's how the sausage is made um, by quote unquote Malakis. So, so maybe that's why some of the press don't like him. I don't know. But the debut collection of Louis Vuitton was really well received. I really liked it. And now they're kind of um, they're adopting the kind of streetwear aspect, the streetwear kind of model of dropping clothes and doing little mini drops. So the first drop is going to be um, <clears throat> they're going to they're putting out now in the Mayfair pop up store in London. I'm assuming they're going to take it maybe worldwide. They're going to move it around wherever for the key locations of Louis Vuitton stores and I'm assuming later on it's going then going to be available online because you know it doesn't make any sense to have this stuff not available online especially um, on the back of the news that um I think was it um off white is the most popular fashion bro, or made the most revenue or something i saw a quote somewhere along the lines of whatever so virtual has a lot of pull right now so it would make sense to kind of you know have some of this stuff available online but the store itself the little mini pop up looks really nice man it just looks like it's a it's a little uh, installation within another installation within another little pop up store. Basically, they kind of fit it in, which is weird. How did a pop up store? They kind of did it in a kind of booth style, in a way you kind of see like a booth in a trade show. It's less done. In a, you know, some pop up stores they use it as a way to kind of show you, oh, here's what my store would look like if I had a store. This is like kind of like no, this is a pop up. This is like an, a little trade show sort of little thing, which is, looks really interesting. I like it. Um. It's got the kind of kaleidoscope theme um, that we saw on the runway, which is really interesting to check out. I love that jacket here on the left too. If you can kind of see the screen here, which I'm showing. I've, hopefully I've got it up on here. Uh, I'm going to cycle through some of these slideshows. It's really nice. I actually, I actually like it. it. looks amazing. It looks probably look, maybe it's a little bigger than I'm assuming actually. So some really nice pieces here that will hopefully get a better look at in a minute. But yeah, so, so a pop-up store for the new collection again um i think it's gonna be quite well received i think a lot of people really like the pieces in it there's that monogram monogram double is it double breasted suit i'm gonna say it's double breasted that uh v that asap rocky war uh i'm not sure it's double breasted and uh kanye war too when you that that famous um it made famous with the, from the short sandals i think he's wearing that that suit that virgil made too so that's gonna be really popular I'm seeing the bags with the kind of um, the the wear chain that's going to be really popular too. The little mini trunk will be really something a lot of people are going to like as well. Um, hopefully, I've got some product shots here I can show or run through because I haven't seen. Oh, yeah, here we go. There's some product shots here that I haven't seen. These are just kind of like um, stuff from the line sheet. So not the most, um, you know, they don't they're not popping out from the screen. But it's cool to see some of this stuff. So you got a sort of like a fleecy jacket here, top left, which looks really nice. A half zip. This nice T-shirt too. I think I, mem I mentioned. I remember him saying that he spent a lot of time uh, crafting the perfect T-shirt. Right? There was a lot of ideas behind that, isn't it? right? Um, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure. Right? There's a lot of it. There's a lot of in there. 
of them trying to craft the perfect t-shirt using you know their resources to you know kind of like not leaving behind these streetwear roots and trying to make the perfect t-shirt with their resources that's gonna be interesting i love this jumper the whole, i'm sure there's a lot of symbolism tied in with the whole wizard of oz theme right yellow brick road um you know um finding out that every all the answers that you did need were actually inside of you i'm pretty sure the backpack again i love i love i love is it ir iridescent this iridescent um sort of like um satchel that's amazing of course the um, what did he call it i think he called it accessory accessor wearable or something or whatever it's, it's like a new sort of like um it's a new sort of uh category in in clo in accessories and clothing similar to the alex um harness kind of a chest rig uh, bag thing right so um virgil's got the same sort of thing which kind of looks like a it looks like kind of like a gun holster which has got the the little pouch on the front which looks cool the belt with the chain on the side as well i like the sneakers that um i think the weekend wore and i think asa rocky wore them too i'm not really a fan of the sneakers themselves they look a little bit too retro for me I have I had a few pairs of vintage Nikes that are the similar sort of style. They reminded me a lot of the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. And even back when I was collecting trainers, I didn't want to wear them because they just they're just a bit too cringe. I'm not into that kind of level of nostalgia, but I, but they look good enough that people will like them. If people liked them, um, the Saint Laurent copies of Jordan ones were really popular, right? And I thought they were pretty shitty looking. Um, these these actually look better to the eye than those Saint Laurent um, kind of fake Jordans. So people like them, they're gonna definitely like these. Um, for, again, for me, not for me, but they're good. They're gonna be really popular. I actually, this is might seem like a very contrary point of view, but I actually prefer the low tops to the high tops. I think the lows look quite nice. I think um, they would kind of work a little bit better. But you know, with the highs, you probably have to. Again, p people that wear these kind of trainers want to show off the whole thing, and I'm sure these fits are going to be fucking god awful. But you know, I'm sure people are going to wear them. This little mini um, bag, little satchel thing is incredible. I love it. That's something I'd definitely be up to getting. It kind of looks like a trunk, and it's got the the signature. Hopefully, that might be his signature going forward. This sort of like um, bolts, chain link sort of thing. Really, really nice. I like I like the look of that. What's next here on the line sheet? We've got again, we've got some nice tie dye bits and pieces. Oh yeah, I remember. Um, did um maybe Oct Octavian wore it in a runway, but there, yeah, loads of nice little tie dye pieces. Loads of again, he's gonna. He's I don't I don't really see how anyone thought Virgil was gonna be not be a success at uh, at Louis Vuitton. He's the t-shirts alone are gonna. You know how people are with designer belts, right? Um, you know the Gucci belt, the Louis Vuitton um, belt, um, a few other belts. Fendi is another one. I think he's gonna really smash it with t-shirts. Like he's gonna make some incredibly great graphic t-shirts for Louis Vuitton that are gonna just fly out the store, especially if they're priced around like the two hundred mark, three hundred mark, right? They're gonna go. They're gonna fly out the store. I mean, easy buy for a lot of people. Um, the kind, the harness that he was wearing a lot on the street star pictures, right? It kind of like a back chest riggy thing. Um, a varsity jacket, which kind of look, you know, whatever. If you're into that sort of thing, I'm not really a fan, but I like that white denim jacket. I think that looks really cool. Um, more trainers. Oh, the the actual he's kind of twist on the, on a Timberland looks kind of nice. Again, it's not something that none of his stuff I'd wear. It looks these all sh shoes look like something that Lu uh, Lewis Hamilton would want to wear, right? These kind of like really gaudy kind of shoes. But again, if you're into that kind of thing, objectively they look quite nice, right? Um, a sort of like you know, a, a, his take on a Timberland. You know, with his kind of twist on it, with I like the little. Um, it reminds me of the Adidas that's got the little buttons on the side of it, so that's quite cool. This runner is quite nice. Um, probably in the other colorways, they might be quite popular. Again, the sneakers and like again, little nice details that he's done with the with the high tops with these these design. I like the kind of you know the off white vintagey effects on the midsole here. Um, and again, the colors are fairly inoffensive. They work really well. I think if you're if you're a dude that may. It, I'm not sure if the Valentino sneaker customer is going to wear these, right? I'm, maybe they're a bit too much for them. But if you're a fan of designer trainers, then they're, they're easy, easy cop for you. And again, I, I kind of prefer the low tops to the high tops, the the ones that Aesop Rocky wore. I think they look really well. The black and grey pair. Um, oh, you got a few more underneath here, right? I've missed out here. you got some creepers, which look really nice. Um, these shoes I'm not really a fan of. The runners look cool again. So, so far, everything looks really, 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 really cool. Um, the bags are going to be an easy so again i love them i think that's his i think that's one of his codes right for the house uh virgil um this sort of like um chain link thing on the bag here those that's really really nice detail hopefully they make that into a necklace uh, that's something again i'd easily buy that's i want to buy into it i want to support the cause 
Like, if that's like, I don't know, if that's under 500 quid, that's the first thing I'm buying. Do you know what I mean? Going to a store, reserving it, and putting it there. Um, again, another little uh, pouch here is really nice. But uh, again, everything here so far has looked amazing. Like, there's no way he could have lost. I think accessories alone, forget the clothing. If he just would have just done accessories alone, he would have won. Um, and again, millionaires, like his take, uh, millionaires 2.0, look amazing. And I sort of flip on them where he's kind of, in, he's kind of uh, inverse the, the lens. The gloves are really cool. Those are the ones that Sheck West wore in his performance um, recently too. I think it's like a tie-dye scarf. There's a key ring here, caps, scarf, belt, like he's won. He's won incredibly well. So that's all dropping away. When's that all releasing? It's got a date on it. No date so far. But the Mayfair store, I think, is running until the end of the month, isn't it, at the moment? So you can always go and book that now at the moment. And then I've got one more slideshow here to kind of flick through. I want to see some other bits and pieces. I think from High Snobai. I think they've got some pictures from people that went to the actual uh, Mayfair store. So, yeah, look. It just looks really nice, man. It looks really, really nice and stuff. Especially the accessories, the little bags, the little wash bags, the little wallets notebooks the sunglasses like look incredibly 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 nice i can't wait to see all this. i can't wait to see all this stuff in person and in stores hopefully they'll have a little concession in selfridges or something along those kind of lines um again just to pick up i would i would happily go in store and pick up some of the stuff like especially the sunglasses um the, if they make that kind of that the, again that little um chain link thing on a bag into a necklace i'd happily buy that too Let's see this video from Mandy Leonard. Let's see what she's saying. Because she's a really big, big fan of Virgil. She's always backing him on show studio. Um, let's see her video on Instagram here on Asana Bias. See what she thought the collection. Come on, play. My computer's been really slow today. Maybe it's the fact that I'm streaming. Oh, pop-ups again. Fuck off. But yeah. It looks really cool from the video here. We're seeing here on Instagram. All oh, the chains look amazing. Love that little rug thing. Her video capabilities aren't that good because she's an old lady again, I think, I think possibly. <laughs> but yeah, the coats look really nice. Overall, it's a good collection. Good debut, man, considering what um, a story designer like Ricardo Tishi put out for Burberry, right? It's incredible, isn't it? The kind of stick they give some of these people. Or oh, Virgil, some of this unconventional designer. And then, you know, Ricardo Tishi, again, it's his first, you know, debut collection jitters, but that debut collection wasn't that great. For Burberry and you know he gets you know Scott free mate from the press but you know what, what what can you do yeah these bags look amazing man. amazing 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 have they actually, has this person got more things is there a slideshow here nope just the right, image looks cool there's some slides here that look nice the chunky trainers I'm not really a fan of personally I could probably do without them so that mini trunk is going to be so 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 popular I think he brought that back. I think he mentioned in the interview. I think it was it was discontinued. I'm pretty sure he says, Sign Lands, it was discontinued and he's kind of brought it back. So that's going to be incredibly popular. Um, this varsity jacket is cool. Again, I'm not really a varsity jacket guy anymore. I don't really wear those kind of things anymore, but I'm sure people like it. Again, the fleet, the half zip, it looks really nice. Um, these all, oh, these look cool. I like the look of these. So they're kind of like a brothel creeper, but a high top brothel creeper. Um, so a pointy so a pointy kind of toe box with a strap, look really nice. Not n not not mad at it. That mini trunk again. What, what's it called? Someone says the it bag. What's this caption from who? From versus something. Uh, the new it bag. Got it first. I'm very eager for this soft trunk since the debut at a fashion show. It is a it is it is the male petit male by Ver, by Virgil Abloh. Right. Yeah. So this is gonna be one of the popular bags. This kind of mini trunk that he's made. Um, he's brought back it's going to be really 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 popular i think loads of influencers are going to try and get it and yeah another satchel too so overall great debut collection mr virgil abloh um loads of stuff that everyone's going to want to buy i'm pretty sure um no oh, again the wallets are so nice just the wallets themselves are gonna are just gonna fly out of the stores when they come in there's no way shape or form of that everyone's gonna want because there's he's got his little codes there with a the little orange tab on there the chain there's little things that he's done without Without collaborating, you're right. So this is without his this is without a Takashi Murakami collabo because I think Louis Vuitton have done one before, haven't they? Takashi Murakami collaboration. Maybe when Mark Jacobs was there, or maybe when Kim. I don't know. They've probably done one already. But this is without him getting an artist involved. He's already doing these things. He's already hitting out of the park. So imagine what he's going to do when he gets a contemporary artist involved in his venture and they start collaborating. It's going to be insane. I can't wait to see the the fruits of all of it to come very 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 soon. But anyway, that's an hour. That's me done for today. 
Um, I'm going to come back on the other side, hopefully again tomorrow, another show to kind of catch up on stuff that I missed out on because I've got so many things to talk about. Um, but yeah, this has been the Excellent Zing Show episode on 119, man. Thanks a lot for tuning in, as always. Um, tomorrow's a big day for me because I'm going to be breaking the Sober October uh, hold on my life and enjoying a couple of drinks at Tapped which I'm DJing at in Tapis. So if you're around from 7 to 11, I'm going to be DJing at the fame, world-famous Tapis bar in Westfield. So come on down and hear me play some tunes. Um, and yeah, and the rest of the weekend, chilling out, taking it easy and preparing to start a new occupation in the next week. So that's going to be very interesting things to do. Oh, and also catching up on Daredevil. I'm, I'm, I think I'm on like episode eight at the moment. So I need to um, finish that hopefully by the end of the week. But again, it's, it's, an, it's amazing when you've got stuff to do, right? When you're busy, it's hard. Like back in the day when I used to think I was busy, when I used to think I was doing things, I used to f- always find a way to like, you know, binge watch Game of Thrones, all these sort of things. But now I'm actually doing things. I've I'm finding it hard to binge watch stuff. Like I'm only up to episode eight of um um Dead of I think it's thirteen episodes. And usually I would have finished this within a, you know a couple of days. But because I've, I'm so conscious of the, the time I have available or the times that I have, and I need to make use of it, I can't be wasting it doing dumb shit. So now that's why I'm making sure that I'm uploading podcasts every week. So yeah, thanks so much for tuning in. As always, if you want more information regarding moi, please visit my website, xnozinga.com. You can find a link below the show notes for all that malarkey. You can see all my DJ dates, my blog, photography pages soon coming. We've got a store there with a t-shirt if you want to cop all that malarkey. It's all there. Visit the sponsors below on the website too. You can check that out too. But as always, thanks a lot for tuning in, tuning on. I will see you guys again bright and early tomorrow morning i'm assuming because i'm a soldier and i'm going to get things done when i say i'm going to get them done but thanks so much for tuning in again to excellent show episode number 119 it's been a pleasure see you again very soon peace